How's everyone doing tonight? I uh, appreciate you guys jumping on with me. Um, we've been trying to do these community lectures uh, a couple times a year to kind of keep people up to date to what's new and what's going on. Um, I've done quite a few of these over the, the last few years. And uh, I've been getting a lot of questions about people in their Google searches and what's new and what's going on. And um, I just decided to just put together a... Uh, a quick rundown on what's new in joint replacement, what new technologies we have that have uh, improved the, hopefully the overall outcome and longevity of, of hip and knee replacements going forward. Um, so this is gonna be very informal. We'll go through a few things and, you know, I find the benefit here with these talks is that you get a chance to kind of ask some questions, um, not necessarily about your particular uh, thing, but, you know, people here, you know, my aunt Trudy in Topeka had uh, this replacement and it was done like this and why is that? And, you know, any questions like that would be welcome. All right. So what's new in joint replacement? Okay. Joint replacement. Um, I'm Ken Rauschenbach. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I've been in the uh, Newburgh area for uh, about 23 years now. Um, I belong to a group called Orthopedic Associates of Dutchess County. And I've been practicing in uh, Montefiore, St. Luke's uh, for pretty much that whole time. Um, I do uh, lots of joint replacement, both uh, hips, knees, and shoulders. Um, and we're going to concentrate mostly on the knees today. Um, and then we'll answer some questions. <clears throat> What's new in knee replacement? Um, the goal today, we're going to discuss some advancements in joint replacement surgery, things that we hope in the long term will benefit uh, our patients. And uh, what we're always looking for is one, um, longevity. Um, joint replacement, specifically knees, typically lasts about 15 to 20 years. And that's a broad range. And you know, there's many factors that contribute to how long they're gonna last. It's uh, um, just like the tires on your car. Um, they say they're good for 40,000 miles, but you know, if you're running up and down the, uh, the bumps and you're going off roading uh, every day, it's going to wear out more quickly than if you, you know, you drive your car, you know, on Sundays to church. So um, by improving our technologies, uh, you know, hopefully we're going to give uh, those joints that we're putting in there um, new options so that they can last a long time. Um, how do they affect the uh, patient outcomes and results? Because that's what we're all, uh, you know, most worried about, right? I'm going to have a joint replacement. How am I going to do? Is my pain going to be gone? Uh, how much pain am I going to have around the surgery? Um, and we uh, continuously work uh, to improve all of those things uh, through multiple, multiple modalities, um, whether it's technology of the prosthetic itself, um, how we place the joint, um, or the medications we use in the perioperative period in order to uh, hopefully get you less pain, more motion, and longevity. One of the new things that have uh, sprung up over the last few years is ambulatory total knee replacement. Um, in the 20 years I've been doing joint replacement, uh, that's changed quite a bit. Uh, when I first started, uh, a typical knee replacement would stay in the hospital about four to six days. Um, and now we've moved it to a point where about, you know, 10% of the joints in the, uh, in the New York and the Northeast are being done on an ambulatory setting. And that's going to, you know, increase to about 70% over the next couple of years uh, due to a number of factors. And uh, some of it's driven by the insurance companies. Others are driven by our improvement in technology, allowing us to get people up and mobile and able to go home in that really short period of time and same day surgery, okay? Um, we've uh, delved into this here at St. Luke's. Um, it's about 10% right now. And every couple of months, we're moving up a few percentage points to make this the, uh, the norm rather than the exception. So, uh, like I said earlier, this is the current trend. Uh, I think 80% will be done in the next five years on an outpatient basis. Um, I do think that uh, it's the wave of the future. And honestly, it's we're going to be forced into it. Um, 
unfortunately, doctors don't always make the decisions regarding healthcare. It's it's based on the uh, insurance companies. Uh, the economics of medicine is uh, a huge player in this, and uh, um, by doing these on a same day basis, it really lowers the cost. You know, you don't have to have a nurse watching you all night. There's uh, an overnight stay, the excess medications, you know, the joint replacement's done. A couple hours later, you see the therapist and a couple hours later, you're home in your own bed. Um, so it's an improvement. Uh, the cost for both the insurance companies and the person. Um, we used to have a therapist come to your house or you'd go to a rehab for a week. None of that's happening anymore. And by doing it this way, we're still getting great results, actually better results than we had before. You know, it's it's not going to help anyone if we cut costs and we uh, slash services if you're not getting the same or better result. Fortunately, we've been able to make these improvements as well as uh, get great results uh, for the patient and long-term and short-term satisfaction is, is through the roof these days. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, by doing these in a uh, same-day setting, you know, we're not putting our patients in situations, going to a nursing home, going to places where there's increased complication rates, uh, infection uh, can be a devastating uh, complication. And we've noticed these outpatient uh, procedures, you know, you go into your own home that's clean, you, you washing your own towels, your own sheets, everything's done correctly because, you know, it benefits you to have the best uh, situation and scenario so that we can avoid these problems. So I had a patient uh, ask me the other day, do you do bloodless surgery? Because um, they Googled it and a friend of theirs had what the, the surgeon referred to as bloodless surgery. Well, I wish I could do bloodless surgery. Um, unfortunately, that's a misnomer and it's not possible. Um, but we made some improvements by improving our blood control. And um, typically we do a knee replacement. We use a um, device called a tourniquet. You've all heard of it. You've watched the war movies and you know you tie off a gunshot and they, they close it off. So the reason we use a tourniquet and joint replacement is to reduce the bleeding while we perform the procedure and then keep the bleeding under control when we release the tourniquet and uh, get the best outcome by being able to see everything clearly. Um, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever Googled or YouTubed one of these procedures. I don't recommend it uh, if you're not, if you're the faint of heart, um, but it, it's, it's a pretty bloody gory procedure and um, there's a fair amount of blood. Um, so by using the tourniquet list, we, uh, we essentially, are trying to do these procedures and get our blood uh, bleeding under control as we perform the procedure rather than after it's done. Um, there are some benefits to it. Uh, you do not have to use that tourniquet, which is a, uh, a device that almost like a blood pressure cuff that we keep up on your leg, um, which can lead to some achy pain in your thigh and some soreness. Um, the uh, Benefit also is it doesn't press down on that muscle, which can cause some achiness uh, and some stiffness. And, and they've shown that you get slightly uh, better range of motion in the, in the post-operative period. Um, after a few weeks, it doesn't make a difference. Um, it's just really more of an immediate increase. Um, unfortunately, there's more blood loss in during the surgery, uh, but because we can see it as it's happening, we can control it better. Um, it really hasn't changed uh, our uh, post-operative transfusion rate, which is very, very rare. Um, I can't remember the last time I had to give someone blood after joint replacement, either method. So blood loss is important or not allowing for blood loss is important. So over the last few years, we've come up front with some uh, new devices Technology has uh, helped us uh, through uh, medication, through um, the uh, types of instruments we use to uh, perform the procedures, as well as uh, some hemostatic agents. The first one that's been uh, a game changer over the last 10 years is something called transoxemic acid. It's, it's an amino acid. It's a very safe uh, um, medication. There's very little to no side effects. 
And what it does is we give it through your IV and it reduces, uh, allows the body, the body to, to clot the blood during the surgery, which reduces blood loss and uh, thus reduces need for uh, transfusion to blood. Um, it's used both IV and uh, directly into the wound. And we've noticed outstanding results from that. And uh, it's now the, the standard of care in, in most places in the country. Um, we have other devices that allow us to uh, stop the bleeding directly. Um, when we have a little bleeding vessel, uh, there's ways to uh, cauterize or seal it off. Um, we now have these special devices that kind of give you almost a, a wand and you can really stop all that minor capillary bleeding that we used to ignore. Um, but now by getting that under control, again, reduces our blood loss and our potential need for transfusion. And last but not least are the hemostatic agents. Um, we used to use uh, medications called thromin, but now there's about three or four new ones. They come in liquid forms, they come in uh, um, powder forms. And what this does is allow to, again, give us a seal, reduce those small capillary bleeders, allow for a very dry field, and again, reduction in uh, transfusion. Pain control. Um, we're all aware of our uh, epidemic in, you know, opioids and the problems with um, our medications leading to addiction and long-term, you know, ramifications on your uh, on on life. So across the country, we've really uh, stepped up an effort to reduce the use of opioid analgesics and. That's the morphines and the Percocets and the oxycodones, um, things you've heard of where, you know, 10, 12 years ago, you'd get a prescription for, you know, 40 or 50 pills and you'd use it and you may get one more. Now we've really, really cut that down. We're using uh, lower potency opioids and augmenting our pain control with uh, other options, okay? Um, a lot of stuff we're doing is intraarticular injections uh, during the surgery. Uh, you've heard of uh, Novocaine, like the dentists give you. We use something, a uh, cousin of that called Marcaine and other long acting equivalents uh, where we inject it into that articular tissue as we're doing the surgery. What that does is really uh, reduces the pain cascade, allows things to really settle down. And you know we have some patients with really very little to no pain in the immediate post-operative period. Uh, I wish you'd worked 100% of the time on all patients. Unfortunately, that's not true. Um, so we use the combination of anti-inflammatory medication, which we give orally as well as through the IV. Uh, basic stuff like Tylenol, which is, approaches the pain from a different uh, level. Um, we use the intra-articular injections as well as the anesthesiologists uh, are using uh, what we call regional blockades. We're given medication uh, around the nerves to the knee or the hip or the shoulder, uh, which allows it to kind of shut off that pain cascade and really gives us a significant improvement on, on what happened. And by getting rid of the pain early, we no longer need those narcotic uh, analgesics. And you know, if you haven't had them and you, you don't feel like you need them, uh, we're having less and less issues with narcotics. People aren't taking them. And to be honest with you, doctors aren't prescribing them because uh, the, the issues that uh, and, and, and the effect on society it's had um, is scary at this point. Um, so we every doctor does a little is a little bit different. We all have our little cocktails and how we do it. Um, but we've all come to this multimodal approach in order to, again, reduce uh, opioid narcotics. One uh, near and dear to my heart is our robotic assisted knee replacement. You might have seen this uh, on you know, some of the news programs. Um, the idea of this is we wanna go ahead and improve on our already really, really good procedure. So typically, you know, total knee replacement is the number two procedure in all of medicine behind total hip replacement, okay? Which is about a 95% good to excellent, right? 
total knee pretty much is 92 to 95% good to excellent rate, meaning you're getting a really, really good result 90 plus percent of the time, which is outstanding, okay? Not many other surgeries or anything, uh, procedures can, uh, can tout those numbers. So the downside of any joint replacement is it's a mechanical instrument. It doesn't last forever. It wears out. You know, we talked about the tires before. You know, you get your 40,000 miles, but if you've gone over the irregular ground and you drove it more than, you know, the normal person, they wear out quicker, okay? And the most important thing about when you get your new tires on is that you get them balanced and aligned. You can slap new tires on. If you don't have those balanced and aligned, they're going to wear out quickly and, and not perform well. The same with the knee and the hip uh, and the shoulders. We need these things balanced. And if they're balanced and even and symmetrical, um, there's less wear. And when there's less wear, the longevity increases. It also leads to better function and less pain. Um, so <clears throat> we've had the uh, robot here in St. Luke's for about nine months now. Uh, we performed about 100 total knees with them and uh, really seen some significant improvement. Um, you know, it, it's subtle, but it's there. And the idea isn't something we're going to see right that first day or something, because we were doing really good joint replacement before. This is what hopefully we're going to see the difference in 10 to 15 years, pushing these knees to last out to 20 to 25 years. Okay. And we know that the better balanced, the more symmetrical we can make these joints, the more the better precision, the better they're going to do. And that's what the robot's there for, to improve our precision by that half a degree or that half a, C, uh, half a millimeter, which is minuscule, but in the overall 15-year process of a knee replacement, it makes a big difference. So this is what the robot looks like. You know, um, the misconception is that, you know, I'm sitting across the room having coffee and this robot is working on your knee. That's not how this works at all. At no point is the robot doing anything. It's a tool that I use in order to um, essentially have 3D visualization of your knee in real time. So the way it works is we have this, um, the, the uh, instrument on the right there with the arms out to the side is a big specialized camera. We put some arrays in your joint and then the screen on the side, we essentially mark out different points and we build a three-dimensional model of your joint in real time. So if I touch a spot, it showed me exactly on the model is on the screen. So before we use the robotics, so we used other navigation tools in the past and, and they were very effective. Um, and what it would do is allow us to kind of plan and make our cuts. This allows us to make the plan and adjust it on the fly, okay? So it really allows us to balance our cuts, make everything as perfect as possible. And the actual robot comes in and holds it there. Now, if I move your, the leg, the robot moves the leg. If I slide it, bend it, it's gonna follow it until it's in perfect position. And then we put some pins in and we make our cuts like we always did, okay? Um, and then we can make little subtle adjustments uh, as we go along. The idea being get the best balance, get the best alignment, and get the best result. Okay. Uh, it gives us direct intraoperative feedback, allows us to analyze quantifiable data, collect it, and then make decisions on, you know, going forward, you know, uh, adjust the way we're doing things to get the best possible result. We have the doctor has complete control. The, the robot doesn't do anything. It's not going to go haywire and mess up your knee. Uh, all those crazy, uh, you know, sci-fi uh, scenarios. So none of that happens. Um, so these are just, you know, a few of the, the new technologies that we're using here at St. Luke's and anywhere in Hudson Valley or in New York State or the, the country um, in order to get, you know, the best possible re result for our patients. Um, hip and knee replacement are increasing over the last 10 years. I think we're doing... 650 or 700,000 knee replacements now a year and total hips are in about 450,000 uh, and shoulders are about 100,000. So these have come a really long way. 
Um, people are more active, they are living longer and they want to be doing it without pain and be able to do the things they want to do. So um, this is a huge industry um, and the better we can make the outcomes and the longevity, the better everyone uh, will do. All right.